So in the morning, we wake up. And some days it's hard to get going. And sometimes, with a little bit of effort, we can get ourselves awake. And sometimes, we're happy. So we can describe these peak experiences with a graph. This is happy. This is not happy. This is the usual range. And this inner light comes from the brain stem. So the brain is basically a hollow ball on a stick. Very simple. And that hollow ball, that's the world that we live in, the world of the mind. The brain stem acts like a flashlight. So why is it wrinkled up? <coughs> Otherwise, we'd have to have big heads. When the light's on, we're awake. When it's dim, we're asleep. Now, we have more than one source of light. We have the light of consciousness. We also have uh, flashes of fear, anger, and occasionally a glow of joy. Now, that when we're happy, we get an extra light. We get the reward activation system turned on. And that reward activation system lights us up, makes us feel active and happy. So when it's turned on, we're happy. When we're awake and it's not turned on, we're not necessarily sad, we're just not happy. So how does that work? The reward activation system is a structure in the brain stem, and it works by sending surges of dopamine into the frontal lobes and serotonin into the rest of the brain. The frontal lobe is where we do our thinking and planning. And the dopamine suppresses frontal lobe activity. So ordinarily, you know, if you look at a squirrel out there, the squirrel will go pause, plan, hop, hop, pause, plan, hop, hop, pause, plan, hop, hop. And then he sees a pretty squirrel, gets a surge of dopamine, goes hippity hop, hop, hop. That suppression of the frontal lobe says quit thinking about it and go, 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 go. And of course, if the frontal lobe is suppressed enough, people get wild and crazy. And people love to get wild and crazy. They do a lot of things to feel good. They climb mountains, they ski, they shop, they eat pie. Mm -hmm. So the common link between all of these drugs of abuse is that they turn on that reward activation system, producing euphoria. So substance abuse is the use of a euphorogenic substance to a planned degree of disinhibition or intoxication Use is within peer norms, people do what their friends do, and serious harm is rare. The problem is that we always end up feeling bad. If somebody is already happy and they use some substance, they don't get any happier, they just get side effects and then a hangover. And they get turned off and they quit doing that. Now, if somebody's got a hangover or they're depressed and anxious, they do the substance they get the high, they think, oh, let's do it all the time. And they experience that as an imprinting experience, which can be pretty powerful. And then, of course, the substance wears off. So the thing is, our bodies like to be in balance. If it's too hot, we sweat. Too cold, we shiver. If we do drugs, if we're exhausted, we do speed. When it wears off, totally wiped out. If we're anxious, so we do Xanax or booze, when it wears off, we're a nervous wreck, okay? We can actually put a little catheter in the brain stem right here and measure those surges of dopamine. And when we do this, and we give our test animal any kind of a euphorogenic substance, it could be marijuana, it could be cocaine, it could be uh, heroin, alcohol, and what we do is we measure the dopamine levels and we find that at first, yep, we get a big surge of dopamine. And then the next day, not as much. Third day, well, puppy's no dummy. He increases the dose. And in spite of that, the high still diminishes. The uh, dopamine releasing effect of the drug and then we have the compensation effect, which we now know as dynorphins. So the dynorphins are the opponent process that inhibit dopamine release. So now we can map out what happens the first time a person gets high. They take the drug, they get the surge of dopamine, compensation effect kicks in, they plateau, drug wears off, and they crash. 
And then, after a few days, they do the drug. In spite of high doses, they get a little tiny high, they feel normal. And then without the drug, they get that low state. So, gee, they start out like this, and this is what they're paying for, and they're unaware of that empty gray after effect. And then pretty soon, they're getting a little tiny high, and they're trying to avoid that. So chasing that high over and over again results in misery because of the elevated dynorphins. And the best that people can hope for is to maintain and feel normal in between episodes of withdrawal. So what sucks people in? A happy person that's up here, they do the drug, they get side effects, and then a hangover. Somebody that's got a hangover or they're depressed, they do the drug, they get the high, the high goes away, and they falsely conclude that the drug has worn off. When in fact, this dynorphin elevation that causes the reward deficiency and the low dopamine goes on for three to seven days. So, when people chase that high, they cultivate their dynorphin levels, and that low gets lower and lower and lasts longer and longer. So if you take cocaine, for example, perfect example of a euphorogenic drug, brief euphoria, followed by three to seven days of dysphoria from a single use. It should be called depression powder. Because people remember the high, they're initially not very much aware of the low. But with practice, they will be. Budget conscious users quickly conclude that cocaine is an expensive way to get depressed and paranoid. And once they get out of that cycle, they don't use it anymore. In fact, this crashing feeling is what drives a lot of addiction. And people that use cocaine intravenously, one quick blast and then it's all crash. Let's look a little more at how the body copes with stress. We have a daily rhythm, a circadian rhythm. We wake up in the morning, we go to sleep at night. And when we sleep, we go into a rest and repair mode. So we have natural substances that help us wake up. Adrenaline, norepinephrine, helps us to wake up. And adrenaline is associated with fear and anger. Norepinephrine, more awake and alert. Cortisol, dampens inflammation. And endorphins, dampen the experience of pain and adrenaline. Endorphins can dampen the effect of adrenaline. And so we end up less vulnerable to anxiety, anger, irritability. And the opiates work by imitating our endorphins. Pro-opiomelanocort is the source of endorphin. It's also the source of ACTH, which regulates cortisol production. And this provides our best evidence that endorphins are part of the stress response modulation system. It helps to modulate how much reaction to stress we're going to have. So the opiates are not actually pain medications. They are stress response modulators. And if you look at the, if we were to take a large population and give them opiates for their pain, we would get an average of about one third pain reduction. We would have to increase the dose. In spite of that, that one third pain relief would go away. But they would end up having rebound pain whenever that pain medication wore off. So that in the end, the opiate is actually causing the pain. Of course, mileage varies. Some people get really good pain relief, and some, some people get no relief, whatever. But what does happen is that the opiates dampen the effects of adrenaline, and so people don't care about the pain. And then they compensate for the opiates in three important ways. The opiates dampen the effect of adrenaline, so we adapt by making more adrenaline. It might dampen the sensitivity to pain, so we become more sensitive to pain. It causes that dynorphin elevation and the reward deficiency. Opiates dampen the response to adrenaline, and this is why people get sleepy. To morph is to shape. Morpheus is the shaper of dreams, the god of sleep and dreams, and that's how morphine got its name. So if people take enough opiate, they neutralize their adrenaline to such an extent they go to sleep and they quit breathing, and that's how they overdose and die. So the body adapts by increasing adrenaline levels, and this helps to prevent the respiratory depression. And now there's this uncanny valley 
where the high has gone away. The high is diminishing every day with repeated use, and the adrenaline elevation is slow. So there's this uncanny valley where people use more and more and more, and they think that their tolerance is going up because the euphoria is diminishing, and they don't realize that the tolerance to respiratory depression involves a different mechanism, which is the elevation of adrenaline. So they go into this uncanny valley where they're using more and more and more, getting less and less effect, but their adrenaline levels are not up enough to protect them from the respiratory depression. They overdose and die without even feeling high. And this is, this is what happens particularly after an episode of abstinence, which is why uh, after 30 days of, of abstinence-only rehab, after 30 days in jail, your overdose rates are so incredibly high, 75 to 144 times baseline. So we could even call this death by rehab. In opiate withdrawal, the excess adrenaline is unmasked. And this shows up as the worst, most significant symptom, which is the anxiety and irritability, the dread. That's the most significant symptom. These other symptoms, yeah, they're annoying, uh, but that's only like the flu. That's not nearly as significant to the individual as that anxiety, dread, and irritability. So the frontal lobe is inhibited by adrenaline, and it's inhibited by dopamine. So in states of fear, anger, and silliness, people lose control. The withdrawal symptoms are most severe for seven to 10 days and three to four weeks with methadone, which is severe, and three to four weeks with buprenorphine, which is milder. So opiate withdrawal, because it elevates your adrenaline, it increases your tendency towards panic attacks. The use of an opiate also pushes this analgesic zone upward where it takes more and more to maintain that pain relief. Whereas if people used a long-acting opiate instead, then they, they would only get a certain amount of relief, uh, but it's going above the analgesic zone with a peak effect of a short-acting opiate that causes the analgesic zone to migrate upward, which is how the short-acting pain medications end up magnifying pain compared to the long-acting medications. But the people that are using the opiate for the euphoria or for the relief from the anxiety and irritability, they prefer the short-acting medicine because they feel the onset of the effect and they feel like this works as opposed to that stuff that's in there all the time that you don't notice. So when the sensitivity to pain is elevated, there might not be anything wrong with you, but it hurts anyway. And then that reward deficiency, the high goes away, the low gets longer and deeper. People might decide, oh, to heck with it, this isn't working anymore. This is their last hurrah, really high dose. And then they decide, no, nah, that's it, I'm quitting. They go through an episode of withdrawal, and then when they relapse, the high is not as big as it was initially, but it fades even more rapidly than it did. So you end up with diminishing, diminishing returns. And if they stop using, the reward deficiency goes away. So we can summarize now the peril and folly of seeking peak experiences with opiates. Anxiety and irritability, increased pain, emptiness, fatigue, and a lack of joy. The frontal lobe is where we make our plans and the frontal lobe is suppressed by dopamine or adrenaline. So the high causes people to lose control and think, oh, let's just do a little bit more. Who cares if we die? We'll die high, which is kind of crazy thinking, but people will get into that. And in spite of knowing that their bad feelings of withdrawal are caused by the drug, they end up losing patience because the brainstem can only see the next few minutes, and they go out and get more drug in spite of their plans to quit. And it's this hijack of the self that causes that loss of control. So if I can say my words clearly, I've got good diction. If I've got a book about how to pronounce words, I've got a dictionary. A diction means then without say. So when somebody's 
frontal lobes are suppressed by their brain stem, they lose their say over what they're going to do. And that's the basic mechanism by which addiction takes people over. Now, you get some people that think, oh, I only do it on the weekends, therefore I'm not addicted. But their overall quality of life is diminished because of that dynorphin-mediated dysphoria. You get some people try to get the ultimate high. These often end up dead. Then you got the cocktail artists. They'll often mix Xanax, alcohol, Soma, heroin. The benzodiazepines, alcohol, and opiates are called the deadly trio. By the time you get alcohol up to the legal limit and above, your risk of heroin overdose goes up by 22 times. So regular users become physically dependent. They get all three types of compensation, and they have to have higher and higher doses, and eventually, nope, they're not getting high. So with regular users, the high goes away, the money goes away, and they end up with this desperate state of withdrawal. They get their sick off, withdrawal, they get their sick off, miserable. And unfortunately, a lot of people will compensate for withdrawal with alcohol, <coughs> and they end up evolving into serious alcoholism. And that's, in fact, the common vinyl pathway uh, for marijuana and opiates. So most opiate users conclude, oh, we've got a problem. Houston, we've got a problem. We need more drugs. And then they alternate between too much and not enough too much and not enough, and life just gets hard and dark. The high goes away, crash gets longer and deeper, trying to get high results in irritability and anxiety, pain, fatigue, and a lack of joy. And with repetition, it evolves into addiction. Who you spend time with is two-thirds of the outcome. And with prolonged abstinence, you get your joy back.